All right, coaches, welcome back to our Rugby WA Coaches Series. This is the first one outside of the, the HP themes that we, we started off with. And now we're going into other areas of high performance uh, industries, sport, uh, but all walks of life. And today we're very lucky to have David Waite on, uh, who's coming across from a rugby league background. Um, but we're very, very happy and also very lucky to have David with his experience and, and where he's been and what he's going to share with us today. So, David, welcome on board. Thank you very much, Dylan. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Awesome, mate. So, just so we'd like to get a bit of a background of you know, your journey and, and how you started out, and I'll just give the, the listeners a bit of a background on, on your story. Well, basically, well, basically I, was a, I was a PE teacher before I even started to coach, and um, that uh, I had a, a mentor that always chased me to coach after I retired early. Uh, I'll refer to that mentor a little bit a little bit later. But yeah, 14 years as a PE teacher and jumped straight into coaching in international rep sides at schoolboy level and um, moved from there to, to coaching in uh, Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs, obviously to St George and Newcastle and Great Britain. So the background was teaching and the background was um, probably a, a very, very, very fortunate occurrence for me was having a very, very influential mentor. Perfect. So I guess that, that's a, a great I guess, word around using mentors because this is exactly what we're trying to do with our coaches and uh, this, this way of, of sharing our knowledge and experiences is yourself right now being a mentor to us. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, they are, they, they are, if you're lucky enough, to, very, very, very important uh, to take on board if you're fortunate which I, I was very, very fortunate. So I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, obviously, Steve's not with us tonight, but thanks for the opportunity. Hopefully, um, by reflecting on, on my journey and some of the lessons I learned, some of the leadership things and dealing with shocks and drama and depression, and understand that it's a crazy, chaotic, fantastic and a very, very sobering occupation uh, to be involved in over 40 years. So. Uh, the heading that Dando gave us was to uh, to focus on player development as much as I can. I'll try and do that across all different age levels, probably from six to, to seniors. Um, I think we should acknowledge that player development just doesn't stop on a particular given age. It's a it's a uh, as long as they're playing, they they should still be should be still be developing, and the coaches should be still working on the whole person. Uh, it's not just about the performance of the physical skills under maximum pressure, etc. So, um, the other thing I, I think is important is before we start going down the path is to acknowledge the differences between what I call myself an old relic as a coach coming from the, the 60s, 70s and 80s and a rugby league background to acknowledge the differences between the two codes, uh, acknowledge the difference in the social values and of the 60s, 70s and 80s versus the current crop. Uh, it's uh, very, very important. It's a different world that we're coaching in. We know we went professional in 1996, but life is just such a different different uh, thing these days, if you like, and we, we must understand that what, what worked back then and what I learnt as I grew through my journey, um, May not always work these days, but I think the basic principles remain the same. You know, that, uh, that the social values and, and uh, the technology and the involvement of sports and the fact that the, it's a, both codes are professional, it's, it's light years away from, from where I started uh, in coaching at the, the very, very best schoolboys at 1979. So let's hope that uh, somewhere through the journey, we can give you something to assist you wherever you are and wherever your goals and aspirations might want to take you. But just remember, uh, the coaching uh, coaching life uh, isn't like page one follows page two follows page three. It's uh, It can take you anywhere. And uh, you'll probably understand that uh, my, my belief is just that you'll have to do the hard work and hopefully that hard work collides with an opportunity somewhere. And uh, if you've done the hard work and the opportunity is provided to you, the chances of being um, successful, whatever you call success, is uh, is certainly increased if you've done the hard work. So we'll probably wander down 
you know, four or five different uh, situations and scenarios and, and focus on the differences between going to a one town, one club situation to a, a, sim a single club in the NRL uh, to coaching a whole nation, uh, even four nations at one point as a, a consultant coach to the home nations in a World Cup. So you're coaching and consulting with England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales at the, in the same time. So that's uh, the sort of journey I'll, I'll probably wander through and um, hopefully we can uh, glean some little pearls of wisdom or you'll have some questions, which I'd much prefer to, to do than rather than sit here and lecture. I'd much prefer to answer questions and um, deal with your thoughts as an, immediately that you have those thoughts. So. And that's uh, that. We'll um, have a little look at the knights. I think, Dylan, if you want to put up that knights little no that little thing, we'll have a look at the knights. And um, I got to the knights because of I was fortunate enough to to be taught by a fellow at school when I was thirteen called Warren Ryan, and he was a Nova Castrian. He came from Newcastle, and uh, he was always going to be the head coach. He was targeted because he was a very, very successful coach. And um, he, uh, he was going to be the man that I got to, got to be part of the process. And I was going to be given my dream job. I, uh, Warren had already got me to, to coach at Canterbury Bankstown after I finished playing. And he'd taken me from uh, Coffs Harbour to Sydney. Um, probably because I was coaching uh, the Australian schoolboys for a couple of years, and probably because we'd never lost a game, or maybe because I had uh, confidence and, and uh, an understanding of the very, very best Australian schoolboy players in the land. <laughs> and um, maybe I could encourage them maybe to come to his club. Who knows? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange, it's a strange world. But that's, I, ended up, I ended up being, in, being appointed uh, the development officer for the club and the reserve grade coach. Warren, unfortunately, uh, being very honest, and we'll talk about that later, being honest by nature, was going to be the coach, but he promised some players when he left Canterbury to go to the West that he would be there for two years. Therefore, the, the contracts didn't match. So he couldn't leave year one. And Alan McMahon ended up being the head coach. So uh, that even Alan McMahon had been coached by Warren Ryan in, in Wollongong. So that uh, the situation evolved that we ended up there in, in Newcastle and uh, we had to, in 1987, we had to plan to take part in 1988. So we did that and we started with a process and it was a holistic process, it was top down. We had to be very, very conscious that we're in one town, one team situation. We had to be inclusive. We set some goals and we'll talk about goals in every situation as we go through tonight. We set some goals and we're accountable to the goals. The most important thing about account goals is accountability. So we're accountable to the board and we're accountable to the players and the players will be accountable to whoever they share their goals with. But our goal was pretty simple. We had to match or better what Canberra did, which is win the comp within eight years. We shared with the board that we'll produce 75% local first grade players within five years. Just be aware that they had no NRL players at the time and they'd produced no international players in the past 10 years. But we said we'll have 75% local players representing your club, your team in first grade. And we had to set up a, a pathway for not only players, but for coaches and administrators. So it was a very holistic approach. The thing they talk about Newcastle was that we set some standards and some values very early on. Alan, Alan McMahon came up with the three T's. We weren't a financial club. We had to be a club that grew talent, but we wanted to look at talent in the, this way. The three T's. They had to be tough. They have to be able to tackle. And they had to have plenty of tomorrows in them. And, and that was where our talent ID started both for the seniors, but that value 
permeated all the way down to all our junior programs as well. We also came up with, thanks to Alan and the players, that you had to be a player in Newcastle that every other player in that team wanted to play with. And uh, it, that makes uh, the coaching side of players and the retention of players and the discipline of players very, very easy. If you have that as a standard and a value, and it's agreed, if you're not one of those players that everybody wants to play with, one, we shouldn't sign you, and two, you shouldn't stay at the club. So we had that as, a, as an overriding uh, value and standard across the, across the whole club. But because I was a development officer, um, I probably want to focus a little bit on the, the role of between six and nine, and six and 19, because we had to establish a program that could identify local players that were going to play first grade and how, how were we going to go about it. So what we decided or what our experience tells us, that we had to develop um, a program that was, as I said, totally inclusive. But the key was not to interfere with the players. Most of the coaches think, you know, that the, that the, yeah, the big pool of players will be the key. Uh, I look at it this way. The players, they can play. If you want to have cream, and which what we wanted, we wanted NRL players. We wanted the cream to come to the top. It's like anything. If you want cream to come to the top, it's what touches the milk, which will get you the cream. So we really focused on probably one of the most important things in, in any development, which is to coach the coaches. That sounds simple, um, but it's who's going to coach the coaches? What's their background? What drives them? Where's their experience? But we had to coach the coaches. But our path started with the juniors of trying to, as I say, be inclusive and not to upset, one, a very good senior comp of eight clubs and two junior leagues, one at Maitland and one in Newcastle. Thousands, of, three, nearly three and a half thousand players. We had 70, 70 high schools and nearly 300 primary schools. What are we going to do? How are we going to identify it? And how do we pull it all together? So we started with some core skill pamphlets. Senior players and the sponsor called Oak was a sponsor. A healthy milk, milk driven sponsor. But we put the core skill pamphlet out. We gave thousands and thousands of these pamphlets. We started a link program. And a link program is where, wherever the Knights went, whether it be to a school or whether it be a club, we always had a school representative, a junior club re representative, and at Newcastle Knights, and they had to wear their club colours. We had plenty of holiday gala days. We provided every high school that wanted it uh, a four unit demonstration, four-week unit of demonstration of introducing the game of rugby league to that high school for both boys and girls. For the primary schools, we divided them into clusters or satellites and we would conduct every Friday afternoon, broken down by those 300 primary schools, we do cluster programs. With every junior club, we offered demonstration coaching sessions for all the core skills of the game. We are lucky enough to have three junior rep sides. We joined the New South Wales Rugby League, so we had the flag, the ball and the President's Cup. And we also had, because Newcastle's affiliated to the country rugby league, we had those rep sides. So we had a lot of very good people had to be identified and a lot of opportunities to give coaches chances to coach. If we're giving coaches chances to coach, one, we have to ID them, and two, we have to develop them. It gave us a very good look at what was out there. So we had to do the resources. We had to write the coaching program. We had to put them in positions. So we did all those things. We, we controlled all the appointments, both allocating jobs to people and also moving those people on if they were unsatisfactory. We provided a stack of opportunities for coaches. We had to develop the content for the courses. We had to clarify what we're looking for, who's going to do the looking, and where are we going to look. It was. Um, it was a, a major, major task. I will, I will highlight the fact that the people, it was who was going to coach the coaches. It was Ellen McMahon, 
myself, but a very, very important person called Alan Bell. And that Alan Bell was involved with Warren very, very early on in Warren's early coaching days. As I said earlier, Alan McMahon played under Warren. I was uh, lucky enough to be taught when, as, uh, at school when I was 13 as the PE master at that stage was Warren Ryan. I saw him evolve a whole new way of playing rugby league. And I was very fortunate to be side by side the, the man as he evolved his, his theories. He was an innovator, right? He, he, uh, he was unparalleled at the time about being innovative and how he was going to approach approach the game so that's what we did with the juniors you know if you can imagine that we've got uh, three three junior levels we've got, we've got 18 coaches what we did was we even closed selection trials we only allowed the players and and their parents to come in we introduced small-sided games we introduced speed tests and this is all 87 88 and we had a lot of, um, or quite a few objections to the way we were going about what we were doing. But the proof of the pudding will be, of course, what were the outcomes of our programs? You know, it's the quality of the people who are gonna to touch the milk that'll get you the cream. It's uh, very, very, very important, that point. On that, Dave, was there, yep. was there much, um, much guidance from the national body during this process, or it was, it was all you guys as, as Newcastle? Knights uh, staff? Nope. No, it was, um, you've, you've got the job. It wasn't uh, driven by the uh, the governing body saying, well, yes, we want to have the new clubs be successful. We'll help you. We'll finance you. No, we were a, a poor club in a working class town and we had to really be careful of uh, maintaining the senior and the local domestic competition to seniors and and blending the, the Maitland Junior Rugby League with the Newcastle Rugby League to maximise the chances of us identifying the talent that was required that we believed that we could coach, that they would produce, produce through to being uh, NRL players and beyond. So no, but that's a, a very brief look at all the things that we did for juniors, we introduced that junior rep camps. Importantly, being inclusive, at the end, the last two days of the junior rep camp, we invited every club in the whole of the Newcastle region to send their coaches and they could be observers for days, for two days, and watch the program. So they could see what we thought were the better coaches with our kids that we had identified as potentially good players go through the initial program from 1988 onwards. And that um, progressed further and further and further as, as the time evolved. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm looking at 87 to 94. Um, but we did, we did something similar with the seniors when nothing was different with the research and the play, but we had to, uh, we had to have a look at um, things going from 93, 90 to 92 and there was a shock. We've been quite successful, the juniors. There were some good things happening. And the first grade coach resigned overnight, seven weeks ago before the end of the competition. After a bit of success, we got to the, a playoff for the semis uh, just prior to, to that, that year. And all of a sudden, the reserve grade coach, who's never, never, ever aspired to be a first grade coach, my, my perfect job was to help really talented people get ready to play. And I thought I had the ability to, to uh, let them cope um, with what, and get them to where I thought they were ready to play. But all of a sudden, drama, political change, you get the, the lovely task of being classified a, a, caretaker, a caretaker coach. So what do you do? Do you believe you can do it? What's the process? So the, the process is, the same. What have we got? We've got uh, a team that's hurting because the coach has left. You've got a team that says, right, change is going to happen. Um, and we've got six or seven weeks to put our best foot forward. And uh, maybe if we're successful and maybe if there's change and I might be, do better under a new system, um, 
maybe there'll be a turnaround in the, in the club's fortunes. So we did that. We, re, we had a look at what we had. Um, and we had to initiate change. We had a, a semi success. We had a lot of fun in the last seven games. We actually led the Broncos in the first half and got a standing ovation, but we ran out of gas in the second half. <laughs> but the players were asked to show us what they got. We had to retain, look to recruit down the, down the, down the line for 1993 and beyond. As it turned out, um, I was appointed head coach then. And when you become the boss, when you become the leader, is it a threat? It's an opportunity. Well, it was an opportunity to, uh, the way we looked at it, to, uh, to initiate some change. And to do that, um, it's identifying staff. And I'll go back to Alan Bell. Alan Bell resigned because he was the assistant coach with the first great coach who resigned, but he was the backbone. If you read any of uh, Andrew John's books or all those sorts of things about the Knights from, from when he first got there, you'll, he'll get a mention of Alan Bell. My job was to get to retain Alan Bell and put him as my assistant. We did that. And um, the, the proof of the pudding is, is in the eating. He, he, he alongside myself, uh, uh, came up with a, a new style of play. And we set some, some very, very important goals. It became the most important thing. We had to be good or the very, very best at one thing in the game. And goal setting is so important once you, would, you set your goals and you get buy-in from the, as the leader gets buy-in and a consensus of what we're going to do. And we chose that we were going to be the number one team in the club at playing the ball the fastest. In other words, the team who won the comp the previous year, which was Penrith, they were the best. And our goal was to beat them. Alongside that, defensively, we wanted to be uh, coached and be best in defence, if that was all possible. And that, for a, that was a goal, two, two goals that a new coach, a new coaching staff, with a lot of good young players coming through a system, set about, given the values of our standards. We set out to do those things. You became a leader, we set goals, we set individual player goals, we set their life goals, but importantly, what they did, once we, they agreed on what they wanted to put on paper, they had somebody sign it, either their best mate or some family member. So one of the things you must do with goals, you don't make people accountable for them. If you don't achieve the goal and nobody knows about your goal, you only have to answer to yourself. If you put a goal and you share it with your best mate or your dad or your mentor and you don't achieve it, you're accountable. And it's a, it's a great, from my, in my experience, across the board from, from the very beginning of this all the way through to the end of Great Britain, goals and accountability are, are vital for, for people to achieve success. In the, we also, at the, at the time, uh, had to because of the radical style of play that we were going to introduce, we had to get consensus. We had to sell and get buy into the change from those that were still there and those that we, we maybe have given new contracts for for 93, 90, 93 and 94. Getting consensus is, is about leadership and it's about, about the sell. And what happens with change, it's a, a former prime minister of, uh, was a was the number one badge holder at St George one time, and he said change is a very very difficult thing to initiate because you're only going to get lukewarm supporters for those that are successful under what currently exists, and uh, some some question mark supporters from those who think they might be successful under the new system. So change is a very difficult thing, and getting consensus is difficult, particularly if you're um, going to be as radical as as uh, our system was going to be. You know, that which was Alan Bell's. And, and these days in our code, everyone, everyone hears about the block play. Well, uh, we, we didn't call them blocks, but it was, a, uh, it was a system whereby I've talked to a number of coaches. Under the old system, they used to have a second man played followed by a, a face ball and these sorts of things. Well, we introduced shape. We introduced where the ball was. There was four options. There was no plan who would get the ball because 
we didn't know what the defence is. Defence, you had a, a plan to to pass the ball to someone when you haven't had a look in front of you to see where the best option was, and that was that was completely unique, crazily unique in 1992, and that was absolutely down to a man called Alan Bell. My role as a PE teacher was say, how do I put this on the park? How do I sell this to the players? How do we how do we break it down and teach it? But uh, that was. Uh, but how do I say this? Well, he's a good friend of mine. We were at his farm one day and we had a few beers. And um, we worked through for days and days and days from that day on about a new way of playing. Isn't that when the best ideas come out? Well, it can be. <laughs> it, it can be. But what the, the, importantly was now you've got a rough idea of the nights. What, what actually was, what actually happened? What happened? What was the outcome? Remember, we didn't have any international players. We had very limited success from anyone in Newcastle doing much in the era of the previous 10 years. Because historically, Newcastle produced a lot of Australian rugby league players. A lot. And a lot of great players and a lot of great coaches. But the, nothing was going on in there before uh, we arrived. We produced, in between 88 and 94, nine local rugby league internationals, six state of origin players. We had 75% in a first grade team that ran on in 1992, five years after we started the plans. 70% of the, the team that won the comp, we didn't, we didn't match Canberra, they won in eight, in eight years, we won it in 10 years under Malcolm. But 70% 70, 70 of that team were local players, they came through the system. We produced one immortal. In 1992, which was the year that I took over, Unfortunately, it was a great year. And your ego might get out of control if you have a great year, mightn't it? But uh, in 1992, we were senior club champions. We were junior club champions. We are the best defensive team in every grade. Along the way, we coached coaches. What did we do between 88 and 94? Out of that class, eight first grade coaches came out. Two international coaches came out and one one Dally M coach of the year came out. So even in a very small space of time, we we're able to, to turn that around, given the background of the people who touched, given the background of giving and looking at coaches and looking at their records and interviewing coaches and writing programs for coaches and giving them an opportunity and constant feedback and opportunity to link to a first grade coach, the first grade coach of the President's Cup, the second grade coach of the Jersey Fleet, the third grade coach of the Harold Matthews. We're always top down, we're always holistic. And Newcastle was very, was very, very successful. Like everything, I just got the sack. Lovely, you know, very, very, very disturbing. Come from a school background, never, never lived in the real world, get, get sacked for the first time, not very pleasant but sent to South Australia for six months, had to leave home, had to leave the family, had to leave the kids, all that sort of stuff. But that wasn't too bad. South Australia, I was coaching under sixes in the hills of Adelaide, freezing cold. And uh, six weeks later, I was coaching first grade again in 1996 at St George. So all of a sudden, uh, the world turns on, it, on itself. So you're sitting away from home and away from your kids at senior years of high school because you have you, know, you develop goals and when you get sacked after being successful like we were in '92, um, you've got to be very very careful. As I said, you know, I coached the juniors in Australian school boys in New South. Never lost a game. Never lost a game in three or four years. Ridiculous. Coaching the best is is, is not the most difficult thing to do. But uh, being successful in 92, you, you, you've got to learn some lessons that you've got to make sure that you can control your ego and be, be a little bit wiser with the media and, and a little bit tougher with retention and recruitment. Because sometimes you believe your senior players that got your success, you can get blood out of stone. And, and being young and, and fairly naive at the time, I, I, uh, I learned some very harsh lessons in, in, uh, in, that, in that period where... Uh, before I left the Knights and before I started in South Australia. But the things turned around and uh, St George Illawarra, the processes are the same. 
we want to talk about player development. We want to talk about leadership. We want to talk about the process of, of getting players better because they've been involved with you as the leader and with you as the coach. In, uh, so in 1996, on the 27th of December, 1995, I, uh, I got a phone call. And um, St George wanted to interview me to be the first grade coach. The Super League was happening and their coach had, had uh, left to go to Adelaide and I'd been shortlisted. One week later, I was on the football field with the first grade team, with what was left of the first grade team after Super League had taken a lot of the, the strong senior players out. But we, had, we were left, and this is what we had, we were left with seven senior players, some absolute quality players who believed in the club of St George and their contracts. And we had to initiate a plan. Uh, we had a whole bunch of young players and predominantly a lot of country kids. Uh, we were 200 to one to win the comp. What, what have I got? What are we going to do? How am I going to do it? I don't have any staff. I have myself. What, what will we do? So this, the same thing. You research what you've got. You interview your senior players. You talk to the staff that are there. Most of them will wanted to leave. Right? And you, and you initiate a plan. So the senior players became really important. We, had, we established a very, very early on a leadership group in, in 1996. We had a very, very good captain in, in Mark Coyne. I'd taken over from a, a man who's got a very good coaching record called Brian Smith. And he'd taken them to two grand finals, but had lost two. Um, but he'd moved on. I think he was looking at a joint venture somewhere. But what was the SWOT analysis of what we had? What was their strengths, their weakness, what they like, what they don't like? That gave me the, the, box, the, the box of nails that I needed to, and, the, and the timber to build something. So I had to initiate change with them. I had to sell the change with them. But once again, I, I chose the backbone. Alan Bell was the backbone at nights. But there's a man called Max Ninnis was always the offsider to Brian Smith. I bent over backwards to retain him. So you had some stability, but everything else was new. And as I said to Dylan before, if you, in this coaching game, you could end up coaching in France or Japan or countries all over the world. My advice is take yourself, believe in yourself and develop staff around you that are local. And it's, a, and it's something that I've, I believe in uh, very, very strongly that that's the way to go. Because too many coaches I've seen or been part of uh, going overseas, taking half a dozen of their nodding mates with them and they feel supported. Whereas if you believe in yourself and you believe in where you're going, uh, you, uh, you will probably find without much trouble some talent that you can develop because this is about player development talent. This is about staff development talent. So we did that. And then Sir George, we had four weeks. We, we had a a sevens tournament, and we had to play a historic game, which is the Charity Shield. So we had to say, what have we got? So we, okay, we've got some young players. My goal is to, what are their core skills like? We're not even talking about positional skills. We're just saying, how are we, how are we good at core? And we work from that, and we develop some goals. We wrote down the individual goals again for all the players. We rewrote the, the language for the club. We rewrote the skills manual for the club. And... We linked the juniors to the seniors so that our senior coaches, once again, were coaching with the junior coaches. We gave them plenty of coaches opportunities. We had a good look at what talent we had in with them. We won the, uh, we won the, charity, sh the charity Shield in the four weeks. And to cut a, a long story short, at 201 to win the comp, we made the grand final round second with a bunch of kids and a, a, a seniors that that adopted and, and bought into and respected change. And we were, we were wise enough to approach it the same way, but on a different, different level for that club. Change happens again. Our sport's changing very much like the old rugby union is changing. We get thrust into a, a joint venture. Does the process change? 1999, we're going to Dylan. 1999. 
what happens? I'm in charge of the joint venture. Have you got a slide for the joint venture there, Dylan? Yeah, I'll bring that or one did up. you keep it all under that? No, I'll bring it up. Bring I can't it. believe, is everyone still awake? I can't believe there's no questions. Yeah, no, there's one question. Okay, there's no, there's no, okay, we can do that if you like. Yeah, I'll bring Christian in. Christian, I'll just take you off mute. You wanna hop in, mate, and just uh, ask Wade your question. There you go. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. You got me, uh, David there? Yeah, I got you, mate. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to stop your momentum. That was good. Oh, um, no, there's no momentum. I'm just blabbering on. <laughs> I just wanted to um, ask about the development officers. You, you mentioned yep. um, there was a lot of development in Newcastle around the, the, the coaches and uh, just, just wanted to find out if there was anything specifically about the coaches that you moved on. To, uh, uh, as opposed to the coaches that you kept on. Obviously, there was a bit of a factory of successful coaches yes, um, at the end of it, but what about those coaches starting out? Was it just, uh, obviously, turning up to the jobs are important, but was no, there the anything jobs, specific? Yeah, that, yeah the, jobs, the jobs were advertised. They went through a, a normal appointment process of, of interview, but because we knew how they were, we could go and watch their teams play, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we, we set down some standards that we, we, uh, we wanted from each of the coaches. Um, and because it's centrally controlled, if those standards weren't lived up to, we moved those people on. So that they had to, to live up to what we set down in the, in the job description. Um, and that, that was being quite firm at the top. Uh, and it wasn't based on success. It was based on what we're after from the coaches and the club values and how we we're going to go about the business. So it's a good question, but I wasn't, I wasn't so good at the, at the player, but I, I was, we were quite strong because I had a good team around me as coaches uh, and very strong on, on the values that, and how we wanted those coaches and to look after what we believe were going to be, as it turned out to be, very, very good players. You know? So uh, yeah. we were very, very strict on, on the standards that we set. We set. And was, is Newcastle specifically, uh, that's a, just a rugby league town, isn't it? Uh, no, no, no. Well, it's got, you know, national soccer teams and national, had national basketball teams. Had, had, uh, it doesn't have a, a national rugby team, but it has a strong rugby union comp. Very yep. much was, that, was that a challenge to the primary schools there? Sorry? Was that a challenge to the primary schools, getting, getting into the, the primary schools and uh, the challenge against the other sports or not? No, not domestic. Well, I said earlier, it's a it's a working class town. It's a mining town, and yep. the working class boys basically played rugby league. <laughs> we are we're talking about the, both these games are knocked down. They've got a lot of collisions. They like, like they've got like a bit of bash up now and then. These people, so <laughs> we uh, we were very very fortunate that, that Newcastle is a very very strong, very strong working class town, and uh, we were very very fortunate to be there because we were demographically we. Our, our, our tougher kids came from the tougher areas, mate. You know, there's been some great kids, yep. great forwards come out of there. But we also saw some good players from out. But those were young players that I, I knew a lot of young players that had been in Canterbury. We, we got Michael Hagen knew too and those sorts of people. So we, we fused the, the two pretty well. So Newcastle provided fantastic players, mate. And we were just fortunate we had a good coaching staff to coach coaches. And that's, that is so, so, so important. And the coaches, you know, like very much like myself, can sometimes be stifling on a player. I always say the kids can play, coaches can stuff them up. It's, uh, I, I said to Andrew the other day, I said, your best coaching is probably your last time you coached. <laughs> so, you know, you learn as you go. And um, as I said, socially, it's all different now because 96, in 96, we turned professional. We had players 24-7. We didn't have that luxury in Newcastle. We had no money, but we had a lot of resources as far as kit to leave at schools. We had only one development officer. I employed another development officer and we ran all the courses, but we were very, very, very inclusive. And we didn't, we didn't put too many noses out of joint. Of course, you never, nothing runs perfectly smoothly, but I think the results, mm -hmm. the outcome, are very, very strong proof that, of the quality of what was... was um, was put out to the to the players and the coaches and the administrators of, of Newcastle at the time. And I said, if you read Andrew's book, 
you get a very good insight into there's an immortal player and, and how important it was in his learning process going through what was in front of them. So that's, uh, that's, that's my answer to him. I just be firm on your rules and your standards and your values and, and uh, don't, don't believe in them and don't waver from them because as soon as you start compromising as a leader, you lose respect. Yeah. Respect and honesty are the two key things that you must have. Thanks, David. Cheers. Great, great question, mate. Thanks, Dej. Um, just on that one, Wadey. So, uh, as you you came into into Saint George, was there um, the same junior holistic sort of developmental systems already in place, or did you have to put some work into that as well? Uh, no, no, I didn't have to put as much. I was very very pleased that Brian coincidentally was an ex PE teacher as well. So, with there's some expertise that you you transfer if you. A PE teacher as far as planning and involving other people and all that sort of stuff and he had linked he had linked the the three junior rep teams to the coaches and he did meet those coaches every Monday and those coaches had to provide you know a 10 minute video and an, an, an appraisal of the team's performance and as, as of the coaching performance and the plan for the following week so that that was there what we did introduce though there was a and it's a very important thing coming down the track in, is that we got the coaches to predict the future of their players. Um, that's very, very, very important. So, talent ID is another whole, we could spend a whole thing talking about how you prepare people to be good at talent identification. One of the best things I saw was to every year you coach somebody, you should write your list down, write the players down and predict uh, where you think they'll go and how far in the game they'll go. Will, will they play for Australia? Will they play first grade? Will they play, you know, 100 games, five years at the top, whatever? And share that with somebody, all right? And keep a record for yourself because it's a very, very important document should you go to uh, Inter Talent ID or if you want to go to a club, you've got a record that's signed off by by someone that was the head of the club at the time. I think that's a, that's a nice little tip for, for Talent ID. There's a little fellow down the top here, down the bottom here. Dylan, what's this one? Sam. Is he gone, is he? Oh, yeah, he was just, yeah, he, he dropped in and now he's, he's all right. Okay. So the, uh, with the joint venture was a, a, a combination of St. George and Illawarra and, and that gave the, another great opportunity because you, you, you inherited two junior leagues. Yep. So there's massive opportunities, one, to give coaching appointments and two, to streamline your resources and, and your club's language and your club's principles and your club's values and standards down through the through the whole thing. So we we were we we're quite happy to do it. It was a very difficult situation. Um, I didn't put a coach out of I didn't put a coach out of a job either, because the, the coach of Illawarra the previous year had made uh, had made the semis and his name was Andrew Farrow. And uh, coincidentally, I'd happened to coach Andrew in in New South Wales. Uh, Schoolboys rugby league, and he went on to play for, for Canterbury and Australia. And we predicted when he was 18 that he would play for Australia. Um, so we became the first ever co coaches in the history of rugby league in the new joint venture. We, I was always prepared to take a bit of a risk, so we innovated that. We, uh, well, what else did we have? We said, Oh, yes, we've got what kind of response did you get from that, Wadey? Um, Oh, uh, lukewarm. <laughs> yep. it, it did cause, because it was so new. The players are going, who, who is the real boss here? Like, Andrew was, was a, uh, a lovely attacking player, but an incredibly good defensive player. Um, I gave Andrew defence. He was responsible for that. And I took an attack. Very similar to what they all do now, isn't it? Hmm. But the players were so new. You know, we're... We happened, I think, lost our first six or seven games. And when one of our first game after the bell for sideline kick. Um, so they did find it difficult. We got feedback from the seniors. We, we kept the senior group going. We did get feedback. They, they were struggling with it. Yeah. Because we had you know, half the team living in Sydney, half the team living in Wollongong. But it also provided some terrific opportunities. We, the facilities in, in Wollongong were terrific. They had beautiful beaches and and sand and right next to the oval. We go, how good is this? We're going to train here in summer. So we, we basically, we 80% of our conditioning side was done in surf boats and on the beach. We did tackling practice always on the beach. We did footwork on the beach. 
So it was a very unique, but the surf boats was a very good way of putting groups of men together that didn't know one another in very physically demanding situations. Mm. So uh, we, we took the opportunity to try and put the group of men together uh, by being a little bit risk-taking and innovative, you know. Then we raced surf boats from Wollongong to Port Kembla. You know, a couple of blokes weren't too happy to jump out in the ocean because they were frightened of sharks. So you had to change the, some teams had to change the rowers over to get another one in and that, the boat had to pick up the bloke who jumped out. So we, were, we, we did that and we, we were, over time, the group got on particularly well. We had some very, obviously, very, very good players. We had, you know, uh, Salty Cap at the time but it was uh, 3.2 million, but we were certainly over that and so were Melbourne. And, and we had, you know, you know, seven or eight Australian players in, in the team. And, and we set some goals. Once again, and it's this, the common denominator in, in my life. And both Andrew and I walked into the board and said, if we don't make the grand final, you won't have to sack us because we're not, we're not the right people if we can't with this team and this roster can't make the, make the grand final. So, so we did that, but we, we'd done all the stuff to, 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 to build underneath it as, as well. So well, what was the outcome of that? Well, the outcome of that was that you know, 99, year one, we made the grand final. And we, got, and we lost. So, well. so in 96, we made the grand final and got beaten in that one. In 99, we made the grand final again. And so neither of us was sacked <laughs> because we said we wouldn't be there if we didn't make it. Um, but we, we got, we got uh, beaten by Melbourne in the grand final. And it was... Uh, Probably lucky we don't have Ando on here because he'd, he'd pipe up on that one, wouldn't he? Well, some of the, some of the boys from the from the coaches that, that I've been talking to him about would have probably read the book by now. And he talks in, in glowing terms of of all the, of all the marvellous things they did at Melbourne. We did beat Melbourne in, in Melbourne with any team to do it that year. And then we beat them again in the semi-finals. But when it counted, they came from, I think, I think they might have come from about 18 6 down and they won the game on a penalty try. The only, the only penalty try in the history of the, of the grand final in the NRL. So... It was exciting, you know, but uh, we achieved what we set out to achieve. Um, but what happened from then is, is probably a, uh, an interesting lesson in coaching. Um, I was just personally probably a little carried away with, um, in, in 92, back at the Knights, when we were so successful in being club champions and seniors and juniors. And, and I was probably equally as carried away when we were supposed to come last and I got the major coaching award in, in 96 and we lost the grand final. But at, at the end of that, we just lost the grand final and four months later, I get the sack. And um, for coaches who, who achieve success, it is a, a, a bitter blow. And um, it, it was a, a great time for reflection. Unlike the first time, I, I, uh, and be, I was able to look at the possibilities and um, I wasn't sure what to do so I sat my family down and said I have these opportunities and I said I could go to New Zealand and have a similar role you know coach New Zealand you know, and coach the Warriors and I could go to North Queensland I could go to France or I could go to Great Britain all within you know a week of the the announcement that I was I was leaving the club and we had a, uh, a round table, sorry, rectangular table conversation. <laughs> and I heard this come from the table. We don't like you when you're doing that. I said, what? I said, we don't like you when you're working the way you work every day on, the, on your job. Uh, we don't want you to be a, a first grade head coach week in and week out. We, would, we think you should go to Great Britain. And uh, that is a seriously sobering moment in your life because all those guys in front of us are uh, aspirational coaches and they want to be successful. Um, all I heard was my life balance was out of whack, regardless of what success I felt. Um, I had neglected other parts and I'm just saying that... Uh, one of the best things I, I do when I talk to coaches is, is to remind them about the life balance. And um, you shouldn't need sobering events like I've been through to, 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 get, to get that message. So um, as it turned out, though, um, I, I did follow the advice of, 
of my family and my kids and wife and, and took on a role as the director of performance and head coach of national head coach of Great Britain. And um, that was probably one of the best things that have ever happened to me in, in relation to um, moving on in, in coaching. To take over a whole country is, um, is daunting in its own way. Um, but once again, my life lessons and my mentoring experience of, and my experience now that I had gathered from the, the previous years and experiences, I think I was, I was ready to have a look at it. They did have, uh, initially, they did have a 10-year a world-class plan funded by uh, Sport England, which was funded by the lotteries in England. So they had an existing plan. And this is seriously significant. It's as significant as what was produced in, in, uh, in some of those other areas. That the plan adds pressure. The plan was stated plan in the thing was to be the number one playing nation within 10 years in the world. Now we put that in context. Uh, Great Britain, England had never beaten Australia for 30 years. And the, the strange symmetry of the whole thing was that in 1973, I was playing in the third test against Great Britain at Warrington and we won. And we won the Ashes back. Hang on, I just get employed to coach Great Britain. I hadn't won it since to get it back. So here I am, I'm at Leeds, at Headingley, sitting there going, this is crazy. I've been given a job to get this back and I played in the game where they lost it. So, so that was a nice little aside to the fact that they wanted to be number one. Full circle. Uh, eh? Full That's, circle. It's crazy. It's crazy. But they didn't actually know that I had a British passport, so that my dad's English. So I didn't feel like a foreigner. Mm. And as you can imagine, the, 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 the former Great Britain players were uh, semi-hostile, I might put it in that way. They weren't uh, the Alex Murphys and that of the world and the Malcolm Reallys who coincidentally won the comp with the Knights after I left. Um, they weren't that happy with the fact that an Aussie was over there coaching their national team. But that's, I've got the job, what are we going to do? We've got a plan. The process is, what do we got? What do we need? What are we got to do? Well, the plan was, is well written. How are we going for time, all right? Yeah, all good. No worries, buddy. Uh, if you ever get a chance to have a look at it, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a great plan. It's a great plan. They divided the country into, uh, in junior level. In the junior level, they divided surface areas and service areas to regions, regions. So we had a massive camp program, massive identification program from surface areas and get into the camp. So we had 50 or 60 coaches that I could look at every year right through the system. Uh, but we had to do a massive job with talent ID, but we'll talk about that possibly as we go. But um, we, uh, we worked on the philosophy that after I had a look at the plan, they had these fantastic camps and they said, this Johnny Smith over here. I said, who's your best player? They said, Johnny Smith. I said, well, right, can, you, can, I, can we look at him play? Oh, no, I, I can show you and do a dummy half pass and make a tackle and do all the core skills, all isolated, not in a game. But he scored the highest points. I've gone, seriously? Right, compared to coaching our, our, highest, our best juniors, it's a tough road to get to play for Australian schoolboys or that, that, in that age bracket, it's a tough. They've got to go away and they've got to play four or five games in a week. And then if they, if they stand up they, and they're good enough, they get through. These guys go to national camp and they get rated without playing anybody. <laughs> so we introduced the phrase, the best have got to play the best more often. <laughs> we want to see how the best go against the best. So we instigated massive change. So since that, we had, in our camps, we played two games. We introduced... Origin style, the War of the Roses, you know, the Lancashire versus Manchester. And so we introduced that across the board. So region played regions and all those sorts of things. So the best played the best more often. And, and hopefully we were, we were going to develop a, a system 
alongside the same thing was with identifying coaches and coaching the coaches from England. And with the coaches in England, you've got to realise that in 2000, there was not one British coach coaching Super League. Not one. So what was happening in, our, in that code was that all the Australians who aspired to be NRL coaches went to England and got a job in front of their English counterparts, but they were still apprentices. They, they had never coached first grade. And obviously quite a few of them went over there and were very, very successful, and they still are. But we had no coaches that were British coaches coaching Super League, but they've been coached by our apprentices. So we had to fill the void. So we had to go down and coach the coaches again. So we had to uh, identify and give opportunity to as many coaches as we possibly could. And we offer, we offer weekend free coaching seminars over and over and over again. We invite certain people that we, we believe that might be interested and we, we just kept it open, which was the coaching bloke called Ray Unsworth and I, kept them open and we got people with expertise to come along and talk to them other than, than, just, than just Ray and I. So we, we coached the coaches over there and we coached them. We had a fantastic system for the kids. You know, it was um, beautifully funded, but there's massive cost for transport with buses to get all those games going on from surface area all the way to the thing. Alongside that, we we see we got to the national camp, and from national camp we picked a national team, and then we picked an international team to play France or Australia or send them on tours and all those sorts of things. So we had a core of good players. But, but once again, parallel to that, we had another list called the fast track list, which which very much similar to what sounds like uh, Steve's got happening there, where those identified as potential Great Britain players, at no matter what age they were, whether they were 14 or 18 or, or what, were given access to uh, all the sports science, all the mental stuff that we could possibly do, all the testing we could do and anything they needed. You know, we, we dealt with their schools, we dealt with their, their, uh, their junior clubs, we dealt with their, their guardians. We stopped them playing more than, you know, 33 games a year. Um, we really put a lot of time and effort into them uh, and belief. So we, we identified probably, I think, it was, I think it was probably about 14 players from all over the country and we used to use the use of the university as a as a as a centerpiece for we to take our talented fast track kids there. The other thing we did was that we had to because we had the money, we were involved with it. Every Super League club had a development officer, we played a role in in their development. So we had to spend money, we gave them money to spend on their programs. But we didn't do that without quality control. We'd have someone go out to the club. We'd have someone watch their, their delivery. We'd have someone look at right through all their books and all their programs. And if that wasn't up to standard, the centre didn't send the funds for the development, which is not the junior club development. It's the performance line. It's the kids that have been talent, targeted by Warrington or Leeds or Wigan all right, to fall into their production line. We funded that, but we also quality controlled it. And if they didn't pull in, they didn't fall into line, we controlled the funds. So we set the standards, we set the tasks, and we judged that. That worked very, very, very well. So that wasn't working like that before, Wadey? No, no, no. That was, that was initiated by us that, that, you know, every club was left to their own device and whatever happens, happens. Now, we formalised the process for the development of the performance players line within the clubs. It, it, it's changed. But with the, the period I was there was the 2000 to 2006. We still control that. We still wrote the programs for the coaches that got the job for the international teams. You know, some of your guys, are, 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 oh, all these guys you're coaching, you're in you know, state sides and those sorts of things. So we wrote out a program for them. We, we coached them through that program. We got them to be part of the production of the program with our, under our guideline now. So we're able to develop the coaching program developed the coaches because those coaches are the ones touching the kids. As long as the best ones are touching the kids, the kids will come to the top. Yeah. You know, if you, if you don't have that, 
you're not you're not you're not going to get you're not going to get the outcome that you want and uh, it's it's very 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 important to, to follow that process of of the key words or the trigger words that I've been using nearly all along you know so what happened there after all, all, all that um, I had had the other role because it was a split role so all the juniors are progressing. And I said, what happened over here? Was these poor fellows here? They haven't won for 30 years. What did we do there? How are we going to deal with them? What did we do? You probably nearly be able to answer it now. You probably could nearly answer it. So we did exactly the same with the seniors as with the juniors, except we didn't have any footage of players to analyse. So I, I paid 80,000 pounds, I think, a year to have every game videoed and uh, broken down into each individual player every time he touched the ball or whether it was on the screen. So I developed this massive library of, of content. So once we had that, we could then formalise the selection process uh, and then we could get say, right, these are my top 35 players. I believe we've probably got eight or nine that are capable of playing international football. So we had to write a development plan for those and try and get the club coach to buy into the, to the plan for that player. All right. We had probably a mid-season meeting and we, had, we didn't have any, too many games. So these guys play you know, like 40 games a year. We play 26 out here. So they're tired at the end of the year and they expect to then go into a camp and, and win the Ashes. Well, chances are minimal because they're exhausted and they're, not, they're all carrying injuries that day. So we tried to develop them alongside their club coach rather than in camps under the auspices of being an international player. But we had footage, we could prove with footage that every player needed to do X, Y or Z because this lets this one down, this lets this one down, et cetera, et cetera. So we developed, we developed, we developed that. The other thing we did was we had a chat to some players from the Ashes all the way back to 1973 because occasionally, in that 30-year period, Great Britain won a game. All right? And I was trying, we're, we're trying to find out what is in the, the blood of these people. Um, and is there a common denominator that they were only ever able to win occasionally one game? And what did they do after they won? Why couldn't they win again the next, in the next test match? And, and that, was a, that was a fascinating exercise. It was a full day listening to like me, an old relic saying, this is what happened. <laughs> All right, this is what we did. You know, we had party, we went away for two days. You should have, yeah, yeah, it's terrific stuff. You know. But what happened was that nothing, nothing seemed to have worked. And uh, I probably can say to this day, it still hasn't. Um, but we, 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 did, we did identify that there was one of the, the problems was, deep down, the players never believed that they were going to be good enough to beat them twice. So belief was a massive, massive problem. So try to, try to sell and encourage and do things where you could grow belief in that anything that you think is impossible is possible is an interesting task as a coach. <laughs> all right, we have quality players. We've got all the record holders playing. They've got some good players in the team, but they don't play at the same level, because they're not the best playing the best every week in England. There's, there's a strong four or five clubs, and then the others are not the best. So they're not used to, in Wayne Bennett's term, drinking at the well of winning every week, how the process of winning follows this, this rule. So I, we decided on doing something, take a risk. I thought we'd do um, fire walking. Well, let's try that. Um, but it wasn't just for the players. I'm not going to ask the team or players to do anything I wouldn't do. So we decided to do some fly walking. And uh, that was the doctor, the professors and the, the gear stewards from right, right down. Not a problem. I was going to go first. By the time they were ready to do the fly walking, I was thrown to the back of the line. The oldest man, the, the oldest man in the whole organisation was a kit man from St Helens and he wanted to be first. So it was Quite amazing. As it turned out, um, we beat Australia four days later in my first test match against Australia. We didn't win another one in that series, though. All right. 
but we started the process of growing belief that things aren't impossible. You know, even though when you first saw the fire, you would say, I would never walk across that pipe. But they did all those sorts of things. That's a risk taking, being either stupid or you could call it individual, or whatever you like to call it. But we did it. And uh, it's never been forgotten by anyone in England. <laughs> but uh, uh, we did start uh, to, to grow the, the, the belief about what was possible. But in the, at the senior, so with that video thing, we, we, we did develop a massive pool of resources for players and coaches and camp manuals, you know, and uh, Steve, your boss even had a part in writing diagrams. We, we, everything that was done in the national camp was videoed, was explained. So coaches could take that all the way home. Every club coach had access to everything that was being done. So it was always holistic, always top down, and it's always been our, or my style wherever I've been because of my mentors. Back then, I, I think I learned the lessons reasonably well. So the outcome was that um, I think the split in the, three, in the first test series was something like 40 to 48 points across three test matches. Um, my last, my last three, three test matches against them, I think, was 2003. And this point differential was 13 points. We're in front in each of those test matches with six minutes to go. One of them, the second test, we only had 12 men on the field for 79 minutes. So the team actually played with enormous belief. Um, but the will of winning, when you have people like you know, Fitler, Johns, Lockyer uh, against you, they just tend to be able to find a way. But to reduce it and to have from arguably probably our best coach in Wayne Bennett ring up and say, you've put test match football back on the map, quote, Bennett and Lockyer. So it was a real battle, it was a great outcome, a great outcome at the, at the playing level. You know, success can be measured in, in all sorts of ways. Are you successful because you lose two grand finals or are you unsuccessful? Did you get the gold medal or what was the circumstances? So we're, we're quite happy with that. But I was more pleased with the fact that when I left in uh, 2006, there were seven British coaches from uh, in, a, in a six year period. Uh, very, very pleasing. And there's still, to this day, five coaching. Uh, I think there's only two Australians coaches in the last eight years have actually won the comp over there. There were British coaches winning the comp. Uh, very, very, very happy with that. You know, and we could we could go on and on and on. Um, in that role, I was also responsible for setting up the Cattle and Dragons. Same process, all of those sorts of things happened. We got you know, we signed some kids who never played first grade before. You know, five years later, they're playing at they're playing at Manchester in a in a Challenge Cup final. Kids had never played first grade before, but five years later, they were playing in a Challenge Cup final. The process it works. The process works. You have the best, play the best more often. Coach the coaches, all right. They believe in the key standards and values and, and your key words. So, then one of the was one thing that I didn't touch on that I think Ando wanted to touch on was rep coaching, but. I think we might uh, stop stop there, mate, and um, and just come down to the to the conclusion. And I want to just yeah, you know, I just want to say to them, you know, what what sort of coach are you going to be? Are you going to be a coach that that wherever you leave, you've left a legacy? The place will be in a better place for you being there. Or like some of the others, are you going to be the winner and you're just going to take your mates and walk away, and the, and the club is not necessarily in a stronger position. Have you got your goals and your aspirations? Have you done the hard work? Are you ready for the opportunity? Just gonna remember that the journey is gonna take you somewhere. Is it gonna be Australia, is it France, Japan, the States? Are you gonna be living at home? Are you gonna be living away? What impact it's gonna have on you as a person or as a partner, or as a parent? How many times are you gonna get sacked? How are you gonna to respond to it? You know? They're very, very important things when you sit down and you write your goals um, to, to be fair dinkum with yourself. To be successful, my view is pretty simple. There's no magic elixir. There's no single personality 
there's no single method or formula that people can give you. There's only you. Okay, it's up to you. It's up to you how you sell you, how you can build performance from players and your staff around you. Are you going to be a copier of of coaches, a blotter, or are you going to be an innovator? I hope you're going to be an innovator. I was lucky to have someone show me what I thought were the keys were the, to the door that opened my understanding of the game of rugby league. I'm sure you have people in your life that have opened the door for you. It's what you do with it, how you use it, what sort of coach, what sort of leader you will be, will determine whether you achieve the sort of successes that you are, that you should have put paper, pen to paper on, and you should have shared it with somebody of significance that, that will hold you accountable. I hope you're like most of us and believe in, and you strive to leave your club in a better position than when you got there so that someone can, either, someone can build on what you've done. That's, to me, that's, that's very, very important. I certainly thank you for listening. I wish you all the best. Um, and I hope your little ride was um, as enjoyable as my 40 years in the, in the coaching. But if uh, you end up with my hair colour, look out. Yeah. At least you've still got hair, mate. Yeah, in this game, you, you, you really know where it's going to take you. Your job is to be prepared. Those words that are there that Dylan's put up are the, the key, I believe, to um, success as a leader and as a coach and making sure that you have the right things touching the milk if you want the cream. Thanks for listening. Hope it's of some value and we'll move on. We'll no, move on. That's awesome, Wayne. There's some questions coming through, but you know, it's just great to, I guess, the common theme for me throughout all of your, um, your points that you made was really holistic. Didn't matter if you were talking about the player, the coach, the system, the, the club you were talking about, it was always a holistic view. So very uh, motivating to, to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, well, I, don't know what your, I don't know what your goals and ambitions are. I mean, my last little one was, oh, I've written, alongside a couple of other guys at Runaway Bay Junior League Club, we've written a six to, a six to eight and year, five year plan like the building blocks. It's just, it's not performance based. It's core skill based. Yeah. It's not positional specific based. It's at each age group, what we believe you're capable of taking on board. At the end of it, you come out with a very, very good understanding of the game of rugby league, not based on what trying to copy NRL people, but based on you understanding the game that's played game of football played in space and how you understand how important you know, your vision, your communication, and your understanding of space is. No. Let's go. That's awesome, let's man. Keep, let's, let's, let's do some got, questions. Yeah, we've got Damien here. So, Damien, come in with your question, mate. Yeah, cool. Can you hear me? Yes, yes certainly can, Damien. Oh, beauty. Cheers. Hey, um, thanks for coming on, David, and I really appreciate your time. Um, no, it's been no really interesting listening to you. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Hey, um, just... Obviously, uh, most of the discussion tonight's been around obviously systems and processes, um, obviously structures and how you formulate your plans and, and what have you. Yeah. But um, I was just thinking about obviously breaking that right back down to obviously player coach relationship. Yeah. Um, and if over the years of your coaching, have you uh, come up with some sort of uh, personal coaching philosophy about? Um, how you get those connections and bonds stronger with the individual players. Because obviously when you're coaching, there's a lot of pots on the stove um, and sometimes time gets soaked up and obviously the process and you're going to miss that one-on-one -on -one, uh, yeah. sort of player-coach player relationship. Yeah. Um, the answer to it, to be totally honest, is it was not a great strength of mine. Um, and probably yeah. to it, to, to it to a downfall. Uh, I think I mentioned a couple of times, blood out of a stone and, and getting carried away and doing all those sorts of things. There is uh, the technical coaches, which I tended to be classified as, if you read the books about players that I've had dealt with. And then there's those coaches, let's say like, like a Bennett or a Alec Ferguson, that are, that are fantastic man managers. And I probably, I'm, I was fair at it, 
and don't get me wrong, but I'm probably guilty of, of not doing enough work in, in how I could better have done that. Um, particularly yeah. with players that are in camp over a three, a three week test program and they don't get on or they don't get in the starting 17, but they're there for the full time. Those sorts of areas, yeah. I, I, I've probably been short um, and on reflection in hindsight, all that sort of stuff. I'm sure I'm correct about not being uh, adequately prepared to deal with that as well as I would have liked. In the big club situation, it's um, it's a little bit easy because you, you tend to be dealing with just the 17, not 26 or 24 in a squad. Uh, yeah. And you have a long time. You've got a whole season. And I was going to ask the coaches, you know, if you've got a, a rep season, how many hours a week do you spend? Oh, yeah, I get two hours a week for 10 weeks. Well, what can you do in 20 hours? It's not even a day. Yeah. And what you put on paper that you're going to achieve. It's a lot easier to deal with the, the men over the full 12 months than it is in the, in the pressure cooker that's, uh, yeah, you haven't won this thing for 30 years and you tend to focus on those that, that are in the squad all the time and, and hope the others are supporting it and that, that the dynamics between the players and the coaches is, is as good as it can be. But it's probably probably a, an area that when it's not probably it was an area that I was I, I just wasn't wasn't the best at, you know. But there are obviously some yeah. plenty of plenty of resources that you can you can read and follow up on on guys that are very successful. There's Wayne, for example, has got books. Alex got books, but they are very good. At, you know, they're they're very good at that knowing the right buttons because everyone's an individual. It's not the same for every individual that you know in your team. You have to treat A yeah. quite differently to B. Sometimes you have got to deal with front rowers differently. You deal with wingers. Not saying that wingers are any different to front rowers, but <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not saying that. I'm not. Saying, I'm not going there. But it's they are different characters. Mate. They are different characters, and, yeah. and having a skill to assess the right language to use, and the situation yeah. where you talk to them, all the little areas that you do. He, he might be a copy lover. He might be best at you know sitting on a swing with his kid having a chat to you. You don't know. It's, all that is, is sort of as I said to you, it's you, it's you. But if you can yeah. develop yourself in that area, if you identify that you need it, it certainly was something that was pointed out to me um, after I stopped. You know, I always said my last, last coaching game was definitely my best coaching game. But after that, I, I did get feedback about, uh, from staff and from players about the, the SWOT analysis, where your strengths and weaknesses were, you know. It's, yeah. it's good. It's a, you got to be, it's a brutal game. You've got to be brutally honest, mate. <laughs> They're brutal games. Those collisions are quite brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question, though. Very uh, absolutely. Good yeah, thanks very much for that. No, it's a pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Perfect. Thanks, Damo. Uh, Christian, I was bring right. back in, mate. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, David. But um, hey, you hey. mentioned... Hey. I'm back. <laughs> hey, uh, you, you mentioned um, getting sacked like it's... Uh, uh, pretty bl pretty blase, but um, you mentioned when you got sacked. Um, did you see it coming? Could you did you know what you were doing wrong, or is it just a tap on the shoulder, no longer required? Well, the, f the first one was, which was Newcastle. Right, absolutely didn't see it coming because actually two days before I got sacked, I was appointed. Um, that was a just way massive curveball. You know, we'd written our staff and everything, and I was talking about it, but we'd written or he'd written documents about how you point up, what you look for. And um, we'd just beaten Brisbane Broncos for the first time in our history in, in 1994. And we started in 88, remember? And uh, we were actually celebrating on a Sunday, or, or might have been a Saturday, Sunday at a pub. And uh, uh, I was told that I was successful, I was going to catch. And uh, Less than 40 hours later, I was told I'd, I'd, never, I'd never coach there again. So that was left field. That, that one I didn't see coming and it, it, was, it was dramatic. And as I said, it's the, fir the first time. So I was a, a, a bit depressed over that for quite some time. But to be fair, like, the coaching of attorney is pretty strong. Uh, Wayne, Wayne Bennett actually rang up and said, what are you doing? He asked me to do some work. It was three months. And he said, he said to me something very interesting. He said, who have you written to and said you're looking for a job? And the answer was obviously I hadn't written to anybody. And um, I think he used these words. Well, you can sit there and wallow in your self-pity or you can get off your backside and do something about it. Not a bad lesson. 
<laughs> not a bad lesson. So the other one at um, the 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 other one at at St George was um, the co-coaching thing. Uh, we asked the board after the grand final in 1999 to make a decision early on in January what they were going to do because we decided Andrew and I that based on player feedback and and that year even though we made the grand final. The players weren't that happy with the co-coaching, so we asked them. We asked them to decide on one. So uh, I, I think I I was pretty confident that I knew what the outcome would be because I was a little bit more politically savvy in after that many years in in the game about where this was going to go. So that that one was was um, was not a major not a major shock to me, um, and it was nowhere near as. Uh, as devastating as the as the first one. St George was a was a great club, a great historically a great club, but a very very sporting mature board. Um, but you put two clubs together, then you get a little bit of argy bargy politics going on, I think. And there was a a, little, a few disruptions with with the, the us and the us and the them component in you one, and and they solved it, but they didn't make a decision until cop this my birthday. That in May we asked for a decision in January. So uh, yeah, it, that but that wasn't a drama. I mean, it wasn't like my life was over. I was fairly confident. I was fairly successful. Um, but as I said, I was carried away. That you know, you think you're doing a great job. You're getting, you're going okay. I, I, I never was in the Super League war. I, I never got paid the big bickies or anything like that because I was in South Australia the year that that happened. I wasn't actually coaching, so I missed the boat. But, yep. Um, those sorts of things happen, and as I said, I, I, I left St George, which was sad because a, a great club, but I got presented probably one of the greatest challenges that I've ever had, which was to try and get the Ashes back and 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 do Madonna's to put in a, uh, a structure that would make them strong. And to be fair, the people like the James Graham, the James Robies, and the Sean O'Loughlins, they're all in the system, um, are all still playing today. They're all in that that first line of twelve players, and we we got something like eighty percent strike rate. With those kids that we said would play for Great Britain, so we did lots of things yeah. right. Um, but then I, you know, just, I, just, I, I didn't be moved on. Sorry, just from um, uh, a, a coach, a professional coach at your level, where do you um, continue to um, develop your skills from? Um, at that top level to, to stay on top of the game, to be innovative, or is it just executing the basics as best as possible? Oh, no, no, yeah. I, I, I continue to watch the game. I, I continue to, you know, offer suggestions to ex players that are still coaching <laughs> under the, the game's changing all the time and the sports science is changing all the time. So I, I do that, but the best thing I've, I've done is to, to sit down and, Spend a week or so writing a, writing a, a core skill program from for kids, who in a in a way that I would never thought I'd ever be able to do it, uh, because when I first learned was you, know, you followed the instruction, you did it the the way you were told, and you'd copy this and you'd copy that. But I'm I'm a, a massive believer in 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 uh, the young people discovering themselves uh, based on what they see. Uh, how things are done. Um, so I really, really do like that. And the program that we wrote for the kids up, up where I, I have a beer on a Friday at Runaway Bay is um, is based on on space, understanding how core skills help the game and how how your vision and understanding of the space, the space that's actually between try-line to try-line and the space that's between sideline to sideline and the fact that people are, are moving this way or that way both offensively and de defensively, creating space, denying space, either with or without the ball. Um, and hopefully those kids in the next five or 10 years, if we, if we stick with this club system, as I say, no positional specific stuff, just the basics put under more pressure each year and expanded upon each year, but we'll develop some players that, that might end up look, look like they know what they're doing when they've got the football in the hand or when they're defending. So, because a lot of people, in the game, the, the way the game was going in the last three or four years was was uh, was was becoming particularly predictive and and boring, and it's it's a, they've moved on a little bit now, so that the, the game's a little bit faster and there's less wrestle, of course. But 
it's, I like the way the game's going. You know, and rugby's got its own issues too about um, and stuff. So about entertainment because you are in the entertainment business and it's got to be entertaining and it's got to be that the result shouldn't be a foregone conclusion. So that's why they net generally change the rules when the result becomes a foregone conclusion. Walter Lindrum, mate, in the billiards, he can... <laughs> He could, he, could, he could do thousands of cannons around the thing and they had to change the rules, mate. So, St. George won 11 in a row, they changed the rules. You know, in 96, Bobby Fulton didn't like the, the five metre rule because he had a young team, so they, they changed the rule to 10 metre rule. So, things, things change. So, I think to answer your question, you've got to keep an eye on what's going on. But because your mate brain's always worked when you see things, you go, oh, what would I do? How would I plan that? But I've gone all the way back to when I said earlier during the, the little presentation that when I was 13, Warren Ryan showed, showed me what happened to spaces when you carried the ball towards the try line or carried it to a defensive line and the penny dropped. And from that day on, I've understood what happens in the game and what people need to know. But you, you know, so I did it, coached it one way to start with, but eventually I had to play, coach against him and beat Warren in a semi that when I was at St Georgian, uh, uh, when I was at Newcastle Knights to make uh, the final, the, semi, the major semi with the Knights in, in 92. I had to beat Warren to do it. And uh, the other rule in coaching is the loser walks, doesn't it? Uh, is that right? The loser walks? Well, the old walk, he didn't walk that day. They didn't come and say, good day, well done. So that was, <laughs> that was a, that's a nice day. But yeah, you've got to stay on top of what's going on, mate. And um, uh, you blokes are young enough and well read. There's so much technology, so this is so much written these days. As I said, I'm just, the end, I'm just a you know, the, the the old the old the old fellow that uh, okay old bloke who was uh, semi successful in in lots of areas and and have helped lots of people do good things. I think you know. So it's been. No, a I appreciate that, Dave. Uh, no, it's, no, it's, I appreciate your questions, mate. Makes me think. <laughs> this, this last Thanks, one, mate. <laughs> Thanks, Tedge. Uh, just last one, Wadey. So, obviously, you sort of brushed over a little bit around one of the players that you, you got the coach in and a model in, in um, Andrew Johns. Just around player development, was there anything that stood out around your approach with him or, you know, is there certain areas that you really need to help where you, you've seen a lot of potential, but you know, there was other gaps that he really needs support on? Yeah, well, Andrew was... Andrew was sort of, I think, 14, 15, he came, he came to the to the attention of the club um, and certainly watched him, watched him play. He had a natural vision, even though in his, his book, he, he, he does acknowledge the fact that we, we taught him that if you go to the middle of the field, there should be 5-5 five, five in our game. And full back and two markers and 5-5. Five, five. So we taught him that the to, to, to look forward and to look at spaces. And he, he, he acknowledged that that was good, but when we saw him play, he, he could do that anyway. <laughs> so I don't know why he put that in the book. That we, we played in a way that would, would, would certainly uh, help players who could count and uh, understood what happened when you ran good lines with the ball and certainly good support lines. We never had decoys or those sorts of things. Everybody was an option. That was the forerunner of what they call shape these days. But he, 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 I describe him as this. He, when, he, when, he's, when he's got the football, he knows what he does and he knows the cause and effect. He knows it's going to do this, this or this. And then when he hits the button on the computer, he has a drop-down list of all the things he might do. Well, his drop-down list is very big, whereas other players might only see two options. He may see 10. Yeah. And that's where, that's where I thought uh, when you watched him at his very, very best. Uh, he could he could conduct that he could conduct what he wanted to happen. He's very much like the, the very best players can do it. They just see things, they understand way before it happens what is likely to happen and what his options will be. And uh, we didn't quite see that very early on. Um, uh, he he was never he was never picked to play for the Australian schoolboys. They didn't see his talent. He came back and he won mayor of the match. After playing four games that week, he won near the match on a Sunday in reserve grade as an 18 year old. So, you know, his first first grade game, he set a club record in trot point scoring. We didn't certainly see that. We didn't see, I didn't say, gee, that kid's going to be an immortal. We just knew he was a, a quite a good natural player. 
Unfortunately, he had Osgood Slatter, so he had to stop playing. We had to stop him playing when he was 15 and put his legs in plaster. So, uh, but he's, uh, uh, it, it was marvellous to watch him at his best. No, he, there was, he was just a, a, a player that he, I think he says, was lucky to be in the system that he was in. Um, he, like most of them that I've talked about from the night, so, well, you know, Dave was a really, really good educator. He was very technical. But, you know, when, when Dave left and Malcolm came in, well, we became really technical and very good men, strong, tough men. So there was a nice combination of toughness and skill that, uh, that was um, evolved before they actually won it 10 years after we started. But I'm really, really proud of the fact that there was 70% local and there's only one player I never signed that played in the grand final. Everyone else I'd signed to the club. So um, we had good eyes. We had good eyes. We, 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 and we were able to transfer you know, through our system of how you identify players. You don't just look at a game of football and you don't stand beside your mate and say, you see that? You know, there's a there's a process and uh, that you you go through and what to look for and and the different situations you like to see them in, um, particularly if you're going to follow our values like TTTs and be someone that everyone wants to play with. You know, you see them in a dormitory or you see them in a canteen where you've got to share food or you see them when they're down and out. You see them when a mate's busted. You see them when the score's forty nil. You see them with your parents, their school teacher. You see them all different situations and. And you set goals with them, and you get a real insight into 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 them. And um, it's not just a, a simple thing to talent ID. You know, I think Bradley Clyde was uh, is a, is an outstanding player. But to be fair, anyone who watched him play as a kid, as a sixteen year old against the men, say that kid's a good player. Well, it's obvious that he could play the game. Mm. But at that age, can you say he's going to go on to do what he did? No, you can't. But he went in another good system, which was Canberra. Canberra had a very good system. And guess what? Tim Sheens is a Canberra. And guess who was alongside Tim Sheens? There's a bloke called Alan Bell. <laughs> so he, he, he and Warren uh, were ve a very, very instrumental in even what's going on today. So it's, uh, I was very lucky in, in, in that respect. But then you still got to, I was a man, I'm just alone. I still have to deliver at St George. And I've still got to deliver in Great Britain. So... I try to get, as I said, to all your coaches, try and develop what you've got around you that's local. You know, I think that's, that, that's a very, very important thing to do. That's an awesome insight, Wadey. And I think you know, the main key takeaway is, you know, this was about player development, but if we don't, uh, if we neglect coaching the coaches and supporting the coaches, then the players aren't going to develop. That's right. Well, the coach's job is to develop the player. So as soon as you get the right coaches and the best coaches, the cream will come to the top. They can play. Well, your job is just to improve them a little bit. Encourage them to, to value the core skill. and Value, value that. And uh, get that right. Because the one thing that's going to cost you a, a grand final, trust me, is a core skill will let you down. It will not be a fancy play. It'll be a core skill. It'll be ball security. Or it'll be a poor decision, a poor tackle. It will not be something fancy. It'll be a core skill. Trust me. That's awesome, Wade. No worries, mate. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, coaches. Uh, our next webinar will be in a fortnight with this new series. will be fortnightly on Wednesday. Um, but as always, this will be recorded. This will go up as a resource uh, for all coaches to, to reference to. So make sure you let other coaches know, part of your club, uh, part of your, your coaching network. Um, you know, the whole point of this webinar series is to be as open as, as we can and share ideas and share experiences and like where you said, coach to coaches, so the players get the, the development after that. Right. That's right. They can play. Just get them better. Awesome, guys. Thanks again, Wadey. We'll see you guys next time. It's a lot of